Hi, I'm Brittany Ann. Today we'll be looking at this old one micron axis and we'll see what they did to make it this accurate. <laughs> So what we have here is an old um, wafer inspection microscope axis, and there were two of them. This one went this way, another one went this way. I believe that the travel is about 180 millimeters. As far as, as condition cosmetically, it's not very good. Um, I want to paint these, um, but uh, the problem is I want to find some, um, I, there's this white, kind of off-white beige eggshell paint, and that's what I want to do, and I like the kind of kind of instrument look that they use on like microscopes and stuff and I don't know where to find that paint. Uh, so these have to be painted. There's also some staining here. There's some mild rust. Actually one of these axes was damaged but um, but before we get into it I want to say I converted this and actually I bumped this and I've got a scratch on this. Underneath these ugly covers we have an axis that's made out of tool steel. And they took an entire block of tool steel and they started carving an axis out of it. And um, I looked up and I, I, I found that the, the amount of tool steel that you would need to make a pair of these axes is $300 in just steel and um, maybe even more and depending on the grade and stuff. And this is just something I 3D printed to adapt the motor. And this is the first generation. I want to make another generation of these. Uh, this is just zip tied as a strain relief here because it's kind of fragile here. Um, so if I can flip this over, we'll get to the top again. And we'll open it. We have some little two and a half millimeter screws, which I don't have very many of. Oddly enough, I've got a lot, tons of three millimeter screws and not very many of two and a half. And I think this will look a lot better with new billows and um, with this with a lick of paint on it, you know, as they used to say. And uh, but uh, what it can do is pretty cool. And let's see, let's get the ugly covers off. I want to get some nice countersunk screws like they used to have. I don't, they don't need to be countersunk. And we'll take off these covers, which are just, um, look like a millimeter and a half or two millimeter of just stamped and folded steel. And what do we have here? <clears throat> we, this is the actual axis part. And um, once again, this is tool steel, this is tool steel, this is tool steel. This seems to be wire EDM'd out, but we'll take a look at that um, in a minute. Um, we have some bellows here in the way and so actually one's in the way and so let's take a look let's get these off flipping up the bellows there's a there's a little keeper here and uh, which is oddly attached with flat screws there's actually flat screws in this the, the funny thing is it's funny to see uh flat screws in something that's metric and um i believe that these are german and i believe that this actually might be like a i'm not sure but it might be like a and uh these uh, screws are all like, they're almost blued. They're not quite oxide. And actually this is kind of too fine for the screwdriver, but we shall be careful. With the ugly covers off, we can see the slightly less ugly access, but um, oddly enough, I like this thing. And um, so what they did was they took a block of tool steel, and this is probably about, uh, probably 150 millimeters wide. And, um, they carved out the center of it. They took a whole block of steel and just milled out the center because apparently uh, cost was no option. And um, this thing has no gibs in it, no gib strips, no gibs. And what, instead, this um, center block rolls on ball bearings on either side. And these are little bearing race keepers and stuff or separators. They are in ball bearings, um, races, they're called separators. But, um, so this block slides on bearings, which are held by these two blocks here. This and this is separate. These blocks screw in f from the bottom and they're held like that. Uh, they also have a block of steel here. And, um, and this seems to be wire EDM'd out, um, from the finish on of it. And, uh, this was probably not cost effective to make. And there's a little bit of staining on this and a little bit here. Um, and uh, I try not to get too crazy with the scotch bright because it is abrasive and it does change the dimensions. And if I ever get real rich, which I might not, <laughs> um, I'd like to have this thing reground 
and um, I don't know who could do it, it um, but it, but this thing was made to be stupidly accurate, and I don't know who can do it. I imagine someone can, especially around Silicon Valley. Notwithstanding, um, so going on, they had made a system to keep this oil, and this was a pot of oil right here, and there was a little fill plug, and you would fill up this pot of oil here. Um, this plug is just pressed in from the top, um, and that would keep it lubricated. Um, but uh, this is the uh, lead screw, and it's cut to one millimeter uh, pitch. And um, if we look at it here, originally this thing has a one millimeter lead screw, and originally it had a 200 step motor on it. And um, I think it was a Superior Electric made in Bristol, uh, Connecticut, where I used to live, oddly enough, and uh, where, where I don't live anymore. Um, on the on the um, on the stepper motor, it had a four X planetary drive, which I I've chucked, and, and um, I I just don't know how, you know, I don't know how accurate it would be. It was anti backlash, but it was really fiddly, and um, I saw it as not the best solution. And um, then they had this huge control box, and it was a micro stepping um, control box. It was clo ran closed loop too, so they were really worried about it. And I think the um, the, the micro stepping um, uh, uh, the micro stepping box was four x or eight eight x. But even if we figure it out, then it was it was a four x uh, micro stepping and a four x uh, planetary drive on a two hundred step motor with a one inch one millimeter lead screw. That comes out to uh, that would comes out to be like um, a third a third of a, 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 a of a micron per step, and that that turns out to be um, like less than two tenths of a ten thousandth of an inch in U.S. customary units, which which most people think is SAE. Currently, I have this set up, of course, with the same lead screw, which is one millimeter, and I just put a thousand step. Uh, motor on it and um, these these motors are 1,000 steps per revolution and um, I have no doubt them being five phase motors that they can do that kind of thing and so it turns out to be one micron per step and and right now there uh, the uh, resolution of this access is um, about a third of a ten thousandth of an inch and um, in US customary units I tend to think uh, instead of instead of calling them U.S. customary units, we should call them UEFIC for it excludes U.S. from international commerce. Because really, who wants to buy our stuff if you have to buy special tools for it? Um, anyhow, in that argument of uh, about SAE versus metric, well, we lost, and that's all there is to it. If we want to sell our stuff overseas. We really want to use metric. There's a difference between resolution, accuracy, and repeatability. And originally, this was the um, this was the resolution. That's what it can resolve to the more or less the clicks, the detents, as it were. Um, then there's an and, and then um, accuracy and, and resolution are two different two other things. Like um, accuracy would be how close it can get to the. Uh, to the uh, to the um, resolution, and then it's repeatability. How often it can do it, and um, because this was old and this was made in I believe 1989, it was actually made in third day, um, third month 1989. This is old. I'm sure it has some wear on it. It was originally damaged, and I'll show you some of the repair I did on one of these, and. Um, um, because it was older, I figured I'd dumb it down to one micron. I suspect that this can hold one micron in, um, fairly closely um, in, in its pre even in its present state, even though there's some staining on it and the covers need painting on the front. So at the end of the unit, I have this Vexta 0.36 degree um, five-phase stepper motor, and I like these little things because they're convenient and it's one thousandth of a revolution, so that's a nice even number. And um, I'm surprised that uh, like the, Ch the Chinese companies or, or an American company even um, hasn't really manufactured, um, you know, thousand step motors in any quantity, any great quantities. Um, these things would be really cool for a 3D printer because they would allow you to use less micro stepping and micro stepping isn't all that accurate. Um, anyway, there was a proprietary plug or a cable here or something like that, and I drilled this out, made a template, um, and I filed this in. I, I think I have pictures, and I'll show you. 
I want to lay this out for a, um, a DB, DB9 plug. So I want to put that just like that, and I want to drop it in from the front. So I've got a paper template, and I taped it on right where I want it. And I've got a, um, a this is a this is an optical centering punch. So you've basically it's a little base, and there's two holes in here. And uh, the way it works is there's a little there's a little dot at the end of this little acrylic rod, and this drops in here, and then you take that out when you get it lined up. And, and let's see if we can let's see if we can get this to work on the, on the video camera. And I always put my finger over the hole I'm not using. And you can see the little dot there, just barely. Let's see if we can focus there. You can see the little dot. And as we, let's see if we can find one of our other things. This is not easy to do through the camera. I'll cheat a little bit and there. You can see the dot and we move it over the other dark thing like this. There's the dot and there's the thing, there's the dot and there's the thing. We try to get it in the center and then and actually, I should, I should, I'm going to check this. I'm going to check this once with my, to make sure I got it good because I, this is actually a part I need. So let's see if we can get that. So we have that just about in the middle, and I always cover up the same the extra hole. And then I give it a tap with a hammer. Okay, two taps. So two holes have to be tapped. The outside ones have to be tapped at 440, and uh, I have a little a little tap, a uh, little tap held in a tap wrench. And these things are pretty hard to tighten up. And uh, I also use this is oddly hint an old an old typewriter brush. That's what I think it is. And I generally try to clean the tap as best I can, especially when working with aluminum. Aluminum is pretty soft, and I try to uh, and I try to keep the tap clean. Um, and clean it before you put some oil on here. This is actually sewing machine oil. I happen to have that on the bench. And getting it started is somewhat uh, challenging to get it started straight. And if I don't have a way of letting you know if you start it straight or not, because if you don't have it started off straight, or for many other reasons, it'll, the tap a tap to small is very easy to break. But fortunately, aluminum is not is not so is not so tough. And so I try to look at it this way and kind of turn it. And you have to be careful of turning it because you have a lot of torque. You can apply a lot of torque and snap off the bit and look at it from two directions. And so in the beginning, I don't back off much. I give it like maybe at least two turns before I start backing off. Let's see if we can get this in the middle, which is it's a little bit challenging because I need to... Here, let's move the camera back because like that, that should be better. Anyway, so... so I, I feed it in, you know, like a few threads and, and break off the chips every now and then. But um, aluminum's pretty soft and it goes easy. It goes easy as long as you're, you know, careful with it. If you were really aggressive with this, it'd be easy to snap off the spit, especially with uh, holding it like I am. But uh, and you know, I'm trying to hold it for the camera. And generally, it's it's going the way it wants to now. There's not much I could do about it because it is, it is started, and we just have to hope that we did it right in the first place. Um, this is a 3D printed mount here um, to replace the original, and um, an original gearbox mount, and um, which the planetary box. And unfortunately, I had a, a little gotcha here, and um, and I needed to file this a little bit. But you know, sometimes you know, I, I you get in the heat of moment of things, and you just drop something really quick and print it, and want to get it going, and you know, stuff happens. So the wires are just strain relieved here. Um, a little bit of um, a little bit of like silicone would be nice here, just for additional support. There's not much else I can do. These are wires coming out of the motor. I didn't design this motor. I'm just using it. Um, the wires go through this um, end, end cap here, and this is, uh, I believe, I believe this is like 6061 aluminum, and it's just black anodized. This is the lead screw. It's it's really nicely polished, oddly enough. I don't think it's got much wear on it. It just seems to be made really nicely, and um, it's probably about 15 millimeters in diameter, and... Um, uh, you can see I've got polyurea grease all over the place, um, lubricating this because I tore all this apart. But what I want to show you is there's a little spring-loaded plunger here, and um, this is the end of travel um, micro switch right here. You can hear it, 
And um, oddly enough, this over travel system wasn't that important to them. Originally, there was a system with a with a cantilevered arm with a with, with a kind of a mechanical advantage system with another micro switch that. Um, um, use the center basically. They use the center to uh, a, as their important um, alignment thing, so there would be less wear on it. Because they figured you wouldn't want to wait to go all the way to the end to get to the end of the axis, and then all the way to the other end to get to the other end of the axis. And so they have the thing actually calibrate or zero on the center. This little plate here, this little this little uh, this little piece of metal right here that they took the time to blue. This isn't even black oxide. This is blue, and, and um, 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 these screws might be blued as well, and these screws are blued. Uh, uh, um, the only other thing they might have done is just heated them up in oil, in an oil bath, like watch parts. I'm not sure. But um, this particular part, I don't know what it does. I really don't know what it does. I've been messing around with this thing for a while, and I don't know what it does. And these screws tend to be... Um, lathe turn screws and a lot of flat um flat headed fasteners you know and um this is once again the uh, oil fill plug um for the um for the pot of oil and uh, we'll get into that so i feel bad that there's some wear on here at the edges and stuff and um maybe at some point i'll give it a coat of uh, flat black paint and um but for now, let's take see if we can get this um, end, end cap off. And uh, we'll crack these fasteners. So, crack them open. So, under here, we've got a little little grease reservoir. And um, I, you can see I've got polyurea grease. This actually fits in here like this. And there's a little retaining ring here. This little this little boss feature rides on the inside of this to kind of center it and stuff, so to help you put it together so it doesn't go uh, all over the place. Underneath this cap, which was filled with grease, they have a little set screw, and um, and what this set screw did is they is it pushed against this ball bearing here, and um, this ball bearing is set into the end of the lead screw. There's also an E-clip right here going around the side. It's a C-clip or an E-clip going around the side. Um, there's a washer here. And, and somewhere in this system, there's actually a Bellevue washer, and which is like a spring washer. Bellevue washers are used a lot in um, precision equipment. They're also used under sometimes under variators of uh, scooters and oddly in, in um, anti-personnel lines. So this set screw is actually set, is locked by this set screw. But anyway, this push the screw pushes on this bearing, which pushes on the end of the shaft. I don't know if this is the best way of doing this. Um, so it's so it has its advantages. It has its disadvantages. Um, otherwise, I've used as abrasive contact bearings to 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 basically get the thrust forces under control, then the, the inaccuracy in the bearings would be divided over several bearings. Um, but at the same time, um, this thing probably didn't, you know, move all that much, I mean, in its whole lifetime. And um, so I don't know. This this is interesting. I don't think this is a bad design. I don't think it's a good design either. It's, it's okay, This as far as this is concerned. This is usually filled with grease, so it's pretty happy. Um, and um, these bearings, uh, this bearing would likely be the single, uh, uh, you know, a wear point in here. Um, and um, that could be easily replaced. Um, so people work on stuff mechanically a lot, um, point, often point with their fingers. And there's actually, the nerves in your hand are actually split up. This There's actually one branch that handles this much and one branch that handles this much. And I think people who work on stuff mechanically a lot, they can do that brain thing where... Where this becomes the aiming point of their of their hand as well as this. Anyway, I don't know if anyone in the world's really noticed that mechanics tend to do that, and um, people work on uh, fiddly things like this. Anyway, there's a little um, coupler, little coupler fastener here, and so I'll just loosen this hopefully. And this is uh, this gets me nervous every time I work on this, and it'll allow us to take out the screws holding the motor. Unfortunately, I don't want to damage these wiring, so I just have to be kind of careful with this.
There's four fasteners to hold on the end cap. I'm just using a screwdriver at the end of this handle for a little bit of leverage to crack these fasteners, which are pretty tight. I'm not sure why they're so tight. Uh, maybe the, maybe moisture had gotten to this a little bit since I last worked on it. So maybe I should, uh, you know, at least get WD-40 on it. There's just some wire skins holding in these uh, wires. And I, I had wire rewired this. And uh, I just want to, if I made my wires long enough, I should be able to coax this off the end of this like so. And this is the uh, the the uh, the end cap, and it looks like they machine this quite a bit to get it work. And here's the uh, the micro switch, and um, so just build it, and um, so we can set this aside. Looking at the end of this, we could see the end of the shaft. We can see that there's uh, these 20 millimeter bars of um, tool steel. We can see the ball bearings and also the ball bearing separators. Um, they are the, um, there's some screw holes here in the end for the end blocks. You can see my little flashlight holding this up and, uh, they did make this out of one piece of tool steel and it's, it's an interesting system because it has no gib strips. And so uh, these blocks here actually are adjustable. So you can basically set it up any way you want to. And I like that. I think I like this better than a gib strip. But it has its issue, and its issue is that um, so this this if there's not a lot of material, the base isn't thick. I mean, if these parts aren't thick, like this is this is roughly eight to ten millimeters wide, and um, if you were going to make a milling machine like this, you'd have to make this wider still. The other end cap is pretty much the same, but um, they had put a slot in here so you can take off the coupler and there was also one in the original block here so I put one in the in what I did too and uh, just be aware that you have to have some way to to uh, lock up the uh, and the um, the adjustment the pinch clamp for the um, for the coupler so if you're going to make this kind of system they had a little collar here for assembly mostly and you have a little bearing here and uh, bearing has a little life left into it and um, and so that fits into here and um, oddly enough, the the end of this bearing is non-constrained. So this entire shaft is, as far as thrust movement, it's handled from the other side with the Bellevue washers and the bearing. And this side is not constrained in the axle direction. So this is allowed to slide in here. After a while, this will wear a little bit, I suppose. So far, this hasn't been completely strange. Yes, it's made out of tool steel, yada, yada, yada. We've got a fine pitch screw on here. Um, and um, there's no gibs. Instead, there's this block arrangement. So you can actually take this whole thing and turn it. You could loosen up this screw and tighten up this screw and loosen up um, this screw and tighten up this screw. And you can turn this whole thing if you wanted to. Uh, so basically, you would like... Um, you would take your uh, your dial indicator and you would indicate this and get this completely straight and to your axis. And you could, I imagine you can get this easily within one ten thousand for one micron anyhow. Um, and then you can set this to get the amount of preload you want using these little set screws on the side and then bolt the thing down. So you kind of got to take it down a little bit, get a friction fit and then push it in and then tighten up the rest of the way and hope it didn't move. Anyway... So we've got this, we have this um, threaded shaft here, this lead screw, and, and this is not constrained as far as axially on this side. This shaft is free to slide this, you know, this way, you know, with thrust loads, you know, axially. And um, the whole thing is actually the, the thrust movement or the axle movement is controlled entirely with these Bellevue spring washers, this little clip which holds and pushes this up against this little this little set screw here, which I imagine will wear, but it's kind of a consumable item. You could even make it out of brass. That would be cool, too. But uh, it seems to be lasting. It's got a little dent in it, but who cares? Then there's a little set screw that actually sets the set screw. Anyway, so we don't have the shaft over-constrained. Or do we? Well, what if the shaft was bent? So I've, I've taken off the washers and stuff. So this thing can move this way right on these bearings 
and it's not over constrained. The only thing we care about as far as the screw is the the axle force or the loads. That's the only thing we care about. That's the only thing we want. Because if this screw is bent, it's going to lift this block up. It's going to push it up, push it down, or push it sideways. And um, what they did was they came up with a system in this. And I've never seen anything like this ever in my life. But look at this. This thing can go off axis, you know, off, off of axial. So this thing has a degree of freedom like this. As far as rotation, you know, it, it, so this thing can tilt this way, it can tilt this way, and not only that. The, f the really weird thing is, it can actually move this way and this way while keeping, um, while keeping this load here, this force here, to, you know, to have it pulling along actually on this side. But uh, so, so this can move like this, and this thing can be off a little bit, like a like a millimeter like a millimeter uh, of clearance under there and um and it can it can be off the axle can be completely off a center line up to a half a well up to a half a millimeter and it can still it can still uh it won't bind up and also it more importantly it won't push this anywhere it won't push it up it won't push it down it won't push it sideways so when i saw this i'm like you got to be kidding me and it looks like the whole thing is loose in there, but it's not. And uh, it is very much constrained this way. I mean, I did tests with uh, with uh, optical experiments you'll see in the other video, which is previously to uh, this one. So let's continue taking this apart. Before I, I bolt these, I want to take the pressure off of these little, um, these little I guess they would be Gibbs screws, but um, if this had Gibbs, actually I've already taken them off. And uh, I only really have to do one of them. And we'll flip it over. And I have to be especially careful with this now because it'll, oops, because it'll want to do stuff like that. I guess if you were setting this up, you would do this up, right side up. And, uh, you know, you, would, you wouldn't do this in the bottom. But And I'm going to hold the strip in, which is not easy because this thing is heavy. And now I've got some, uh, you can see that this is loose and I can slide this strip out like so. And we can see this is a, uh, a roughly a 20 millimeter, I believe it is 20 millimeter block. And let's see if we can see the end profile. The end profile, it just has a notch in here for the bearings to ride in. And it's got more of that uh, grease on there. And it's got, uh, looks like six millimeter um, bolts on the bottom. And th they just let the thing contact the inside, the back of it. They weren't too concerned about that. The bearing retainer has 24 ball bearings in it. And um, it's about, it's probably about eight millimeters across, maybe a millimeter or so in each of the little dimensions here. And the ball bearings are probably about, I would say they're probably four millimeter ball bearings. So the, uh, we'll take this out. These blocks are about 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. And they've got like a millimeter or so step here. And these are ground here. And this seems to be like shell milled or, or what have you uh, here. And, uh, but these are ground here, ground here, ground here. Um, the ends look like they're just milled. And they could probably be ground. If, uh, but then again, I don't know how much this angle will actually change the accuracy of the whole thing. And these, uh, these little uh, rails are um, ground and four, at least four sides. I think the ends are too. And uh, I can give you a clean this. And so these, uh, how they made these, they slotted it first, and then they then they probably milled it and then ground it, and somewhere in between then they hardened it. Looking at the block assembly, the lead nut is only held in by these two screws, and these are cap screws. 
So let's free that like so. And we'll, for now, we'll put the lead nut assembly aside. These were where the fasteners were that held the lead nut assembly. And they had uh, milled and bored a hole here and put a cap in. And the idea was that you would fill of oil um, from this side. And underneath here, there's a little hole. And there used to be a little wick. And in the overlay, I'll show you what the wick looks like. This, I don't know what these guys are for. Maybe to protect the screw. I'm not sure why they and maybe in a cheaper version maybe there's a little uh, a thing here to clean the lead screw and that's what it might be for or maybe there was a little block of felt on each one of these that's the only thing I could think of and um, this appears to be from a surf from the surface finish this see I would guess that this was wire EDM'd out because there's actually a radius in here and um, I don't think it's I don't think it was ground and um, I think they wire EDM this profile from here and then they ground these surfaces only what they had to you can see it's it's ground here and finally ground I might add you know and this gets really weird here because um, this whole assembly is only held from this little bit here and oddly there's no threads right here in order to get this shaft to be able to move around like they wanted it to to, to give it the degrees of freedom what you saw what they did is they used um, ball bearings inside these little two parts here to to um, give it a degree to freedom so the shaft can move like this and also to give it to let it rotate a little bit like this on like you know you know pitch and yaw and so forth and then these are ball threaded blocks and then they get the preload using this so this this is preloaded together so it's anti backlash with with these springs on this side. And then there's more of these little Bellevue washers preloading these bearings, which we'll see on this side. And um, in here, you can see the little hole in that. Um, I only want to get this wick thing going again. And um, so that fed oil onto the shaft. And let's, uh, let's take it apart. And unfortunately, I don't have my little wrenches with me today. So we'll just have to uh, kind of soldier on here. And this thing is really fiddly. And it gets worse when you see the inside. And then there's a series of uh, more of these uh, bell. Actually, it's a regular washer. And we have a spacer here. And then we've got on this side, we have a stack of Bellevue washers on this side. Like so. Let's get a good look at them. Let's get a good. Let's get a good look at them. You might be able to see that they're not flat. They've got just enough a dome on them to apply pressure on the bearings. Let's get this side off. And now I might have to pop this bearing off. So in this retainer, let's, I'm going to pull off this E-clip. Try not to lose it. See, there's a little, there's a little E-clip that holds on a little bearing. A little collar which I already loosened. That's a little collar with a little set screw in it. Now we can pull this apart and see that in here. Let's get a rag and wipe this off. In here we've got a block. And get this, there's a slot, a diagonal slot in this. There's a little bearing too. Oops. There's a little bearing that rides in the slot. So if you remember that there were two holes here that mounted this block and that mounted it onto the bottom of the big block and that kept basically, basically that's how, how it transmits its force, its its um, axial force into this block which moves the assembly but there's a slot in here and it looks like they cut a slot and then they mill the V in it like with a like a, I don't know I don't know what the angle is I imagine it would be uh, I imagine it would be this looks like it's actually 90 degrees and uh, but they cut a slot first for oil or grease or something 
and then they 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 build it and then they ground it and this is made out of hardened tool steel and um and so inside this thing there's two bearings that go here and here and then there's another part of it and so that has the same kind of groove on it and so with a little um with a little separator here to keep them from falling out um this will go in here and this will allow this to roll this way roll quite effortlessly as a matter of fact if i stepped on this i would fall and then you'll notice that there's also a diagonal slot going the other way into which two more bearings go let's see if i can stack this up whoops it would go down the center but uh let's put in the bearing retainer first that we put in the plate and a bearing and another bearing and there's yet another one of these and so this one goes onto here and now you can see that we can move this thing actually we can move it straight up and down we can move it all the way to the side we can move it diagonally this way diagonally this way so this thing has two more degrees of freedom than most milling machines i've ever seen i mean this thing can just look at that that's amazing but this thing is held with pressure this way with all those um, Bellevue um, washers uh, do a preload. So this thing is held probably, you know, 100 pounds of force or something like that. And in reality, this thing is, is together a lot better than it seems. And so this thing has some, some countersunk screws like that that go in there like that. And those bolt into the rest of this uh, lead nut assembly. So this this provides a great degree of freedom that, like I said, most mills don't have. And this, I, I imagine that uh, this thing is sold from 1989. I imagine that if there is a patent on this, it's probably gone now. So the lead nut thing is not that, you know, not much different than more normal mills. You have two big silicon bronze nuts. And these are, you know, they probably take, sometimes they like boil this stuff in oil and stuff as if it helps and stuff but uh, i do like that they did have the wick system and maybe i'll get that going maybe the grease is better i don't know um anyway there's two uh there's two bolts that go through this and um they form kind of a bearing surface so like this can slide really nice and still have this kind of stay together this way because it was so tight because uh, it was so loose over here, they can make it tight over here as far as non-axial stuff. And um, then you've got basically two nuts. These are just threaded nuts. You know, they look fancy. They got some extra holes, including the one for the wick. But um, they're just nuts. And um, and they're threaded on both sides. And then when, um, when all the hardware is on, it squeezes together to take away the backlash. So there's no backlash or no perceivable backlash. And of course, the problem with this, uh, with all kind of preloaded anything, including, including this system here, is that if you exceed... If you exceed your preload, then it's going to have a gap. It's you're going to have you're going to have uh, you know you know backlash. So, if you scale this whole thing up, you've got to scale the springs up too. You know what I mean? Because you don't want them to come apart. But still, this seems like a really good system. I mean, if you want just a little more accuracy for something, making these, um, you know, could do it for you. And um, oddly enough, I made one of these with, uh, with only hand tools and, and, and otherwise garage tools and stuff. And I'll show you how I did that. Unfortunately, when I got this, somebody had dropped it or something. And one of these little things has broken. And also, in this picture, you can see the lead nut. So, daunted with the original part being broken, um, I ordered a piece of tool steel, which was like $12 uh, American. Uh, almost that much in euros, if you're still going to have euros. Anyway... Um, I, I kind of hope you do, but I had finished the outside shape and then for it to, to make the slot, I used a hacksaw and, um, a Dremel tool to make the slot. And then I widened it up with, um, uh, just a hand file. And, um, then I was left with like, how do I set the depth to it? And what I did is I used two of the bearings and a, and a feeler gauge in order to know how deep it's going. And I tried to make it as straight as possible. And then I use a system where I took, um, I took, uh, I have a, a little, a little uh, a, a, a honing stone, and I put a piece of plastic 
on top of the stone and used that as a guide and I dragged it along. Actually, the piece of plastic was a piece of Delrin, so it slid pretty easily. And by keep on turning the piece, I could get it somewhat, somewhat straight. I broke up a floor tile and um, made it like a, like a little miniature kiln in order to heat up the part because I just have a pro propane torch. I don't even have a map torch. And I heated up the part cherry red and I tried to get it fairly hot. And um, unfortunately, I didn't have enough of oil and I should have put the oil, made the oil cold to begin with. And I think that it's harder than it was, but it's not as hard as it could be. And when the part was cherry red, I picked it up and dropped it into the little plastic container, which sent flames everywhere. You can actually see in this picture um, a fire extinguisher in the back. And I made a big mess, and it took me hours to get all the oil off of the sidewalk between the breezeway of my house and my neighbor's house. And But eventually I did it. And, um, and then I uh, heated up the part, and I think I heated up high on like a, like a toaster oven or something like that. And um, I tr to try to kneel it, and um, I think I baked it for a while. I'm not sure how long. The part I made using what tools I had seems to work pretty good. I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the original and stuff, but it seemed to have worked, you know. And you try to figure out ways to, and try to be inventive about how you do things, um, and uh, try to get by with what you have. <laughs>